Wow, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. I didn't really, he, he you know, pulled me aside and said, do you want me to give a little intro? And I said, whatever you feel like you want to talk about. And I, that was really amazing, thinking back to kind of where I met Devereaux and how I made that connection and how meeting Devereaux at a photo booth then led to him being involved with the snowboard industry and how he contacted me for photos for, you know, different various projects he was working on and then how that led to meeting other people. And it's just kind of crazy to think that a lot, of, a lot of the world is just kind of like networking, making connections. And I don't know if anyone agrees with that or not. But uh, from what I can see or from what I can tell you, I wouldn't be standing right here in front of you if it weren't for meeting the right people, taking good, you know, making good connections, and utilizing those, those connections to actually you know, kind of build upon each other. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I, I'll admit I am a little bit nervous. It's been a little while since I've spoken in front of such a large audience. But I'm very flattered that uh, I have the opportunity to, to be here. Um, I, uh, I have notes. You know, I came up with some notes as far as things that I wanted to touch on. I didn't feel like I wanted to put together a formal PowerPoint presentation. I want this to be a little bit more interactive. So I didn't want to just sit here and lecture. I kind of wanted to be able to walk around a little bit, make it a little bit harder on the camera guy that has to follow me on the tripod. But that, other than that, you know, I want to actually engage with people, ask some questions, get some feedback, that sort of thing. Um, so just to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit more on the already great intro that Devereaux gave, um, my name is Dave Brewer, and I I graduated from the University of Utah in 2010, so just, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, with a BFA in photography with an emphasis, well, it's an art degree, it's a fine art degree with an emphasis in photography and digital imaging. Um, I've been shooting photos for a little over about 10 years. Um, it started out as a hobby, and then about five years ago, I kind of realized that it was more than a hobby. It was starting to, I was starting to get little jobs on the side that were kind of starting to pay, pay for some of the bills. And at about five years ago is when I decided that I was going to pursue it full time. I think it was right around the time when um, I was working at a restaurant, you know, I was bussing tables, waiting tables, making ends meet, paying the bills that way while still going to school and shooting photos on the side. Um, to make a long story short, I ended up uh, I ended up quitting the job that I was working on busing tables and decided full time I'm just going to start pursuing photography and that was about five or six years ago now. Um, what kind of work do I do? Uh, as Devereaux mentioned, I kind of, I try not to pigeonhole myself as a specific kind of photographer. I, um, I'm, there's just too many interesting things going on in the world. I love everything from portraiture to action sports to beauty and fashion to landscape photography to event coverage to a little bit of everything and I think when you're in an industry such as mine as, as photography there's just there's so many interests and it's hard to narrow down the direction that you want to go whereas opposed to you know a lot of the a lot of the people in this room probably have their own their own interests their own ideas their own business uh, models and it's usually a little bit more narrow you know it's it's one direction um, you know, I just remember hearing about Kistix. You know, I've actually, I know the guys from Kistix. We're actually going to be working together. Uh, as Devereaux mentioned, I do photo booths. So I'm going to be doing a photo booth in collaboration with, Kik with Kistix. And so for them, it's awesome to see, like, okay, they have this model, and they want, it's so narrow, and they want to just push through that. That's awesome. And I think that if, you know, if there's anyone that has those, those ideas, it's all about finding that, that kind of, I guess, the opportunity identification, figuring out a need for something, figuring out what's lacking, what's missing, either a product or a service that doesn't necessarily exist that then you can then zone in on and, and pursue it. Um, so basically, jumping around on notes here, I kind of wanted to find out right now, since this is a business entrepreneur, entrepreneur class lecture series, I'm assuming that most students in here are, you know, they're interested in pursuing that, that that you know that adventure. They have business models, or they want to start restaurants, or they want to start, um, you know, Kistix, for example. Um, so I'm curious: Does anyone, by raise by raise of hands, is anyone willing to volunteer and tell me kind of an idea of something that they have, something that they're interested in pursuing in this classroom? Anyone brave enough? If not, I'm just going to start calling on someone at random. Okay, right here. So I have an idea for a. Uh I want to use uh, um, 
RFID technology to uh, to kind of track people on the mountain and then set up cameras along the <coughs> runs and stuff. So at the end of the day, you can log into a website and you can put in your RFID uh, like ID number and you can get video footage from your whole day. Oh, wow. Uh, of boarding and stuff. So that's kind of an idea I have and I'm trying to pursue. Okay. That sounds like a really unique idea. Sounds real original. That's how ideas start. It's something that you kind of realize what doesn't exist and how can I make that happen? You know, what, what are the logistics? And then there's a lot of planning involved. The logistics of the cameras and the, and the permits and working with resorts, like there's all kinds of obstacles in your way. But I think you're on the right track as far as finding this idea and pursuing it further. And uh, that's exactly kind of what I, what I went through when starting the Salt Lake City Photo Collective. So to kind of give you a brief background on what the Photo Collective is, we have been open six months only. So you know, we're, we're a startup company. We've been open. We started in July. Um, essentially what the Salt Lake City Photo Collective is, is it is a community collaborative workspace for photographers, meaning we provide a large studio photo space with a client area, you know, comfortable couches, big screen TV, places for people to meet with clients, um, you know, uh, talk out the details of photo shoots. We have a hair and makeup station, changing wardrobe organizing room, a large uh, photo studio. And so it's basically a, a place of work for photographers. We have everything from full-time and part-time leases available, as well as hourly rates. But that we also, we don't want it to be exclusive. We wanted it to be something where photographers can come in off the street, get a, be a part of. Um, they can work, you know, volunteers. People can kind of work in the studio in exchange for time to work. And then we're starting to host workshops and classes and all kinds of different ways to get the community involved. So I kind of wanted to take just a step back to realize, well, how did this all come about? So for me, I think that over time, subconsciously, I started to realize I love, I love giving back to the community. I love helping. I love teaching. I love um, providing opportunities for people that otherwise wouldn't have these opportunities. And I gave it some thought, and I, I kind of pinpointed where that first came from in, in this specific field. And it was when I was going to the University of Utah. I was, uh, I was registered in the, you know, I was in the art department. I was really looking forward to getting past the drawing and painting classes so I could start doing <laughs> photography classes. And uh, I had one photo professor that taught, you know, a, a black and white darkroom class one semester, and the following semester was going to be a studio lighting class. And I was really looking forward to that. I was excited. I had already had some studio lighting experience on my own. I had shot photos for different assignments in, involving studio lighting. So I went to my professor and I said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm really looking forward to this, to this course next semester. Um, you know, anything that I should be aware of to kind of prepare myself for it, just wanting to jump in full force. And uh, he pulled me aside after class. And I, I, you know, it still kind of like blows my mind. But he pulled me aside and he said, there's nothing that I'm going to be able to teach you in this studio lighting class that you don't already know. And I said, well, then why am I in school? Like, I'm excited for this class. Why am I going to this class that I'm excited to learn if there's nothing that I, that I don't already know? And I, I took that, and I thought, well, that's got to be crazy. I don't know everything about studio lighting. But he explained that the studio lighting class just wasn't up to par. It didn't have the lighting equipment that it needed. It didn't have, you know, it just wasn't as great as it should have been. So he actually offered me the opportunity to be a TA for the class, meaning he wanted me to help the students Tell, you know, teach the students how to set up studio lighting, um, kind of clean up the studio. In exchange for being a TA, I was going to receive credit for the class. So I thought, OK, well, I was looking forward to learning from the class, but I didn't know it at the time. But forcing me to teach others and to help others actually made me learn a lot more than just sitting through the class. So I started thinking, that's where this whole idea of the photo collective came, was I wanted to help other students in the class. And by helping them, I actually got this self-satisfaction of you know, the bigger picture, something that I didn't even know existed in my future was opening up the photo collective where I could bring in other photographers and show them how to use the studio lighting and help, you know, help, help them kind of pursue their dreams. Um, so here we are, the Salt Lake City Photo Collective. Um, it's a community collaborative workspace. And I guess what I'm trying to explain here with all this long introduction is that I'm wanting you to kind of focus on your ideas, your, your dreams, your passions. And although I'm going to be specifically talking about relating to the photo collective in this photography industry, I think that at the core, they're all the same values for any business mo model. You know, whether you're interested in opening a restaurant, creating an iPhone app, 
uh, or starting your very own summer sales security system company that seems to be pretty popular around these parts. I think they're all kind of in rivals. What, whatever your idea is, take what I'm saying and apply it to your, your, uh, your business model, your idea. The most important factor is what you can offer that millions of others have not been able to which is, goes back to the opportunity, opportunity identification. Discovering an idea, a concept, or a product that either doesn't exist or one that does exist but that could be done differently or better or on a larger scale. So the fundamentals, there's a starting point involved. Your business is, a, your, business is your brainchild. It's your creation. It can be whatever you want it to be. And on the same token, you know, it can be, you, know, you can avoid specific aspects of what you don't want it to be which is the coolest thing in the world. You have total freedom of what you want to pursue in life. You know, your business can be exactly what you want it to be. And if there's something about a certain business that exists that you don't really like, exclude that part of it, you know? It's basically your entire creation. I like, I like that phrase, your brainchild. Um, so identifying the need for the Salt Lake City Photo Collective. Why was there a need for it? Well, I started to realize early on that there are a lot of photographers like me that, that love to collaborate on projects. They love to get in contact with hair and makeup artists and hairstylists and wardrobe and you know, create these awesome elaborate photo shoots. But there wasn't really a specific place for people to come together and do this. There wasn't one specific studio that people could come to and meet and network and, and you know, actually collaborate on these projects. Um, and then, as I was mentioning before, there's kind of when you start that collaboration project process, you, there's sometimes you don't really realize that some of the things that you are doing right now are the things that are going to lead to bigger and better projects, stronger relationships, and more opportunities in the future. So I guess just take a second and maybe reflect on your own business adventures right now. If you just have an idea, that's a starting point. That's great. That's a seed. But who are you connecting with? Who are you networking with? Who are you? actively pursuing, going out of your way, actually trying to meet and, and, and share your ideas with. Those are the kind of people, and if you're not doing that, get started. Because that is the most fundamental starting point, is starting to make those connections, sharing your ideas, getting a team together. That's the way to get things started. If you're not doing that, jump on it. If you already have started kind of going in that direction, kind of take, take a second to think, well, you know, how can I push these relationships for, further? Are these people that can kind of help me along, or are they people that are holding me back? And I think when you decide that, um, you know, it, you, you have two options. You kind of run with it, or you make some changes. Um, so you know, how or why did I feel confident to take on the responsibility of opening up a photo collective? It's a, it's, you might be asking yourself the same question. Like, I have this idea, but I don't think that I'm physically or emotionally capable of putting forth that responsibility of just getting things started. What was it for me that kind of led me to feel that confidence? And I think a lot of it was um, that feeling that I got when I was helping people in the studio photo department, when I was actually showing people how to use the lights and how they were grateful that I was showing them and taking the time out of my day to kind of help them. I got that feeling, so I felt you know, kind of on a whim, I think I could do this on a much larger scale. And I might be kind of a rare case, because I don't think that I put a ton of thought into why? I just had an idea and I ran with it. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but a lot of people have mental blocks where they come up with a really cool idea of something that they want to do, and they come up with a lot of excuses why not to pursue it. And I, I think I, I, I do that in a lot of areas, but from what I've noticed is over the course of my life, I've just kind of had an idea, and without, I, I give it thought as far as planning, as far as you know, the logistics of how it might work, but I sometimes just dive into things and I tend to just work hard to work themselves out. So I, I know that's probably not the best word of advice. Jump into something and it'll work itself out. That's not what I'm saying. You obviously need to have a plan. But uh, for me, it was kind of just an idea, a concept that kind of built upon itself over time, over the course of about three years. I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool to have a bigger studio? Wouldn't it be cool if like, you know, this studio was more than just a studio? What else could it be? So I started thinking, well, I could get more people involved. I could teach classes and workshops. But not just me, maybe I could bring in other, other teachers or other people with experience in different fields that I might not be very, you know, um, profound, you know, I, I might not have a lot of experience in. Maybe I can bring them on board. So it started out as an idea of I needed a larger shooting space for myself, for my own client work. Pursued that idea and it, it went further to, well, okay, so if I get a larger studio, 
What else can it be from a, aside from a studio? Well, I want it to have classes and workshops. Aside from that, you know, why don't we do monthly art galleries? Why don't we bring people in? We can show you know, art from local artists as well as you know, international touring exhibits if it goes, goes to that point. And you know, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that an idea that started that six months ago, we just barely hit our six month mark and within six months we've been able to accomplish all of these vain ideas, these crazy ideas that were just once figments of my imagination you know, a few years ago. We're hosting classes, we have workshops, we have currently on display for this month, we have an international touring exhibit that's been shown in New York, LA, London, and now Salt Lake. And it's like, wow, how did this all come about? It's finding those connections, making those, you know, finding those networks, making those connections, and pursuing those dreams. Um, so I think the importance of networking, I really can date back to what Devereaux briefly touched base on, which was the studio photo booth. It was a side project that I, that I kind of fell into. Uh, you know, my friend was having a party. He said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could set up like some studio lights and shoot photos and we could actually like print the photos on the spot and give them to people. It's sort of like a little photo booth, but like with studio lighting. And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool. And he said, do you think you could do it? And I said, I'll try. And I did it. And from that, someone else said, hey, I saw that you set that photo booth up. Would you mind doing it at this party? Oh, sure, let's do that. And that was literally back in 2007. So something that started back in 2007 kind of snowballed. And it's just kind of crazy to think that making all of those networks, have all those connections from a side project has led to some of my biggest clients, my personal clients, uh, some of my biggest clients that I've met, that like big companies, big corporations I have met by shooting photo booths. And I was just curious. I do, I, I, I live downtown Salt Lake, but I am down here at UVU and Provo and different events down here. And I was curious by raise of hands if there's anyone in this room that has been involved or been photographed by me at a photo booth before. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, six. That's, I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed by that. I thought that it would be less than that. So as you can see, these are six people that would have been strangers to me, but now having been shot, having me taken their photos at a photo booth at an event, they now kind of know who I am. You've been to my website. You've seen my work. You go there to get your pictures. So to me, it was kind of a networking of, you know, how can I take this photo booth project to bring in more people? You go to, I take your picture, I give you my card, you go to my website, you get, my, you get your photos, you put them on Facebook, it has my name on it. You start seeing all these different like networks of just kind of bringing everything together. And to me, that's kind of what led to this, um, I guess, having the confidence to put something together like the photo collective. Like I started to touch base on, it's crazy to me to think that something as small as a party photo booth could really form these net networks and friendships. Um, one time I was doing a photo booth at, uh, at a club downtown. It was a bar, actually, um, at the W Lounge. And this was a few years ago, and this guy got his picture taken from me. And he said, hey, man, I really like your work. I think you, you interact well with people. And he said, hey, I would love you to take some pictures of, uh, you know, kind of like some family portraits, but kind of a little bit more edgy, just with my son. And I was like, OK, it's not really my thing. Like, I don't love family portraits. But he's like, I don't know if you know this or not, but I play for Real Salt Lake. And I was like, oh, OK. Like, I'm into soccer. That's cool. I've never really seen much of you. But you know, that could be kind of a cool relationship. So I, 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 we, exchange conf we exchange information. And I hit him up. And I say, hey, you know, if you want to get that family shoot going on, maybe we can work something out. And his schedule wasn't, our schedule was for months. We were talking back and forth. And it just wouldn't work. Um, and then, you know, we, I kind of kept exchanging information. I kind of started following him a little bit more. Um, and you, at, the, at the time, I didn't know who it was. So I was like, okay, he's some player for Real Salt Lake. Um, you know, mentioning now, it's like, wow, you might know him. But it turns out that this guy that just wanted me to shoot his photos was Nick Romando, who was the goalie for Real Salt Lake. Who at the time, he wasn't, you know, he was, at, he was, a, he was a player for Real Salt Lake, but he wasn't that famous at the time. So we're trying, to, we're trying to make this connection to shoot these family portraits. And then all of a sudden, they go to the, the MLS Cup finals. And uh, I'm thinking, OK, they're in the finals. I guess that's kind of a cool deal. You know, Real Salt Lake, local, cool. And then all of a sudden, they win the MLS Cup, right? They win the MLS Cup. This was a couple years ago, two seasons ago. And then Nick is deemed MVP. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this guy that wanted me to shoot his photos, he's now the MVP. He won the, RLS Cup, or the MLS Cup. You know, and I was like, he's going to be too cool for me now. He's not going to want to like, shoot family portraits. I blew it. Like, I missed that opportunity. I get a call from him that same night that they won the MLS Cup. Phone call, my cell phone. Hey, Dave, what's up? Hey, it's Nick. 
I was like, hey man, I just saw you on TV. He's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just calling you real quick just to see what your schedule's like this week. They're gonna let me have the cup. I was wanting to maybe get that photo shoot set up this week. They're gonna like let me bring the cup in and we can get pictures of it with my son and the, and the MLS cup. And I was all, you got it. Like I'll drop whatever I'm doing, you know? <laughs> Let's do it. So basically the next day, you know, he called, we, we set it up and uh, we, we set up a time to shoot photos of, the, of Nick Raimondo, his son, with the MLS Cup. And I was like, whoa, this is awesome, like really cool. And so then I started thinking, I was like, how did I make this connection? I'm shooting professional athletes with professional huge trophies that are, you know, people are wanting for ESPN and all kinds of different like publications. And I'm like, this all, be, this all came because I shot a photo booth at a club, you know? It's like, what I'm trying to emphasize is, what are you doing now? I think it's, it, it kind of goes back to the, to the Steve Jobs Stanford graduation speech. If you haven't ever listened to Steve Jobs Stanford graduation speech, he talks about um, connecting the dots in the future. There's no way of being able to connect the dots of the things that you're doing now in the future. The only way is taking the things that you're doing now and looking back and thinking, wow, well that came from this and I met that person because I did this. And so there's real no way of knowing what kind of things that you're doing now are going to lead to things in the future in your per personal business field. But I think you have to, be, you have to recognize that, that you should be on that path where the things that you are doing are hopefully leading to bigger and better connections in the future. And if they're not, you need to start actively kind of pursuing those. Um, we're doing okay on time. <clears throat> Okay, um, part of the most, once you have this idea and, and you've recognized this op opportunity that doesn't exist and you're starting to make plans and you know, say like you're like me and you're crazy and you just jump into something and you have, you have a business model, you have kind of an idea, a concept. I had written down things that I wanted it to be, how it was gonna work, you know, how much money budget was gonna ne be needed to open up a space like this. I, I had that thought process. Um, but again, that's kind of as far as it went for me. I was like, okay, I'm going to jump into it. And I think I put so much emphasis on opening up my business, you know, getting the building that was perfect for me. Um, something with exposed brick, this modern loft feel, high ceilings, like in the heart of downtown. Like I, I found, I would look through every single Craigslist and KSL posting for abandoned buildings, something that I could build up on my own. Finally found the perfect spot. And then I was so excited to, okay, I want to I wanna repaint, and I'm going to paint the walls, I'm going to fill in the holes, and then I'm going to rip up this carpet, and I'm going to put down hardwood floor, and then I'm going to put in some, vinyl, some tiles, and then, okay, cool, okay, now I'm going to set in furniture, and I'm going to get all these couches, and they're going to be awesome, and you know, this big screen TV, I'm going to get the biggest screen TV I can find, because I have budget for it right now. And so I started thinking, like, wow, I got so wrapped up in opening up my business that by the time we opened up, I was like, okay, we're open, that's great, that's a huge hurdle, but now what, uh-oh, like, I gotta start paying the bills, I gotta start bringing people in, I gotta start getting people familiar with the space, get them actually using the equipment, get them actually renting the space, and so for me, it was a real eye-opener to get, I was real caught up in, and I think that there's, there's natural hurdles, there's steps, and you have to, you can't bite off a whole chunk at a time, you have to take those steps, you know, the first, the business plan, then opening, then marketing, you know, and kind of pushing that forward. But I think one of the things that I would say was a slight, uh, if I could go back and do something different, I would put a little bit more emphasis on the marketing and how the business was gonna function before opening up. Fortunately for me, um, I've had a lot of great support, a lot of amazing people that have jumped on board wanting to help, now that we're open, wanting to help push it further. But without their help and without their support, I'd probably be struggling. I'd probably be thinking, how am I gonna be able to do this on my own? I'm one person. I don't have a ton of background knowledge in, in marketing, business marketing. I really don't. I'm a photographer. I'm an artist. So how do I know how or what it takes to market towards specific people and get specific you know, clients involved? Um, you know, luckily for me and the Photo Collective, I've been fortunate to have, um, let's see, let's see. Well, I have, I have some notes. I'm just going to kind of glance at some of these. Um, I think recognizing that you cannot do it on your own is really, really important. And I know that sounds like a no-brainer, you know, but depending on your business model, sometimes if it's a small thing, you might think, oh, this is just a small business. I can do it on my own. I'm starting an iPhone app. I'm a programmer. I can do it. And that might be the case for a little while until you realize that, I, that iPhone app or that whatever your small business app is, 
you know, has a larger need for a marketing director, has a larger need for an accountant, and things that you don't foresee in the, in the you know, when you're first creating your idea, idea you don't think that you're going to need to know how to set up contracts or talk to lawyers or set up all kinds of accounting or mailing lists or website design or all of this stuff kind of adds up. And so I think that realizing the most important thing about starting a business is you cannot do it on your own. No matter how big or how small your idea is, it will require the support of many. And not just anyone. It is great to have the support of your friends, your family, your beautiful girlfriend that comes to your lectures, um, your boyfriend, etc. It's great to have support, general support. But in the end, there are specific people that you will need to seek out that can help you build up your vision far greater than you could ever do on your own. The hard part is surviving the good times and the bad that can help you realize who really needs to be on board with your business. Finding the team, breaking through the minute tasks, and allowing yourself to do only the things that you can do. I think that's one of the things that was hardest for me is I have this mentality where I'm, I'm a leader, I can do it all, you know, I can do all this, I can do all that. And it kind of it came to the point where I decided, wow, like there are so many tasks involved in running a small business. You know, like, like I was just mentioning, all those different tasks. So it came to the point just recently, within the last month, I will say, that I realized that there are certain things that only I can do. There are certain contacts that only I have that I need to be emailing, that I need to be pursuing, certain ideas that come from me. But then there are certain tasks that almost anyone can do within the business. You know, there are, um, you know, updating blogs or websites, like little things that I could train an intern to do or an assistant. And then there are things that only other people can do. My marketing director, he knows what he's doing. He knows how to contact people. He knows how to organize classes and events. My web developer, he knows how to create PHP mailing list uh, all kinds of mailing lists to then target certain audiences and get our mailing list. I don't know how to do all that. So I think the, the main thing I'm trying to get across is recognizing and allowing yourself to be helped. There are certain things that only you can do, that your, your time is valuable. Do the things that only you can do and allow others to help you. And, allow, and appoint others to help you in areas that you can't do on your own. And all the other little things that almost anyone can do, there are people that are that that are that are in need of your help in that way, or that help you in that way as well. So recognize and accept that there are certain parts of starting a, starting or running a business that can only be completed by you, and allow other people that are better better in their own field to take care of the things that you simply cannot. Also, uh, allow others to take care of the things that mostly anyone can do. Your time becomes much more valuable when you have a, mil a million minute tasks to complete. Allow others to perform tasks that will allow you the time, allow you the time to perform yours. Let go. <clears throat> Sometimes this happens long before you open your business. You know, long before opening the doors of your recently opened restaurant, because obviously you're going to need chefs, you're going to need um, cook, uh, cooks and chefs and bussers and managers and hosts and hostesses. You're going to need need all of that. So you kind of you figure that out before your business opens. But a lot of the times, depending on the type of your business. You can get started with just you, such as the, the example of, of developing the iPhone app. And, um, and then over time, while the business is starting to pick up pace, you will quickly realize that there are more unseen responsibilities that you simply cannot manage everything on your, uh, by yourself. Hopefully by that time, you'll have started piquing some people's interests, or better yet, have been building up a network of equally motivated people that are interested in working together, whether they're simply wanting the experience or if they believe in what you are doing and there's a mutual agreement, whether it is compensation, trade, or, uh, or, or payment. Luckily for me and the Salt Lake City Photo Collective, I've been very fortunate to have a little bit of both. People that I've been networking with for years have started coming back to me wanting to host workshops and events at the space. You know, people that have already been doing something similar have wanted to come together and say, well, I've been doing this on my own, and I've been doing this on my own. Why don't we all come together and do it at your space? So fortunately for me, I've had that support. Um, people that, I've, that I can say I've been networking with for years. Um, and other, you know, let's see. People that I've been networking with for years have started coming, in, coming back wanting to host workshops and events at the studio. And other friends that I used to let shoot in my personal studio for free have now found bigger and better clients with more budget for shoots. And now they come to me the rent studio space. So there's you know, a lot of, it's networking, it's bringing people together. But then there are a few other select individuals who I haven't really been networking with for years that I haven't helped them, they haven't helped me, there hasn't been anything in exchange in the past. Um, people that have simply come to me because of a combination of wanting experience, 
mixed with believing in the, the potential of my business. People like Greg Thonis, who used to simply come into the gallery multiple times a month. He was a stranger that would come in, and he would, uh, every time he'd come in, he'd bring a friend, he'd bring a family member, and he was always sh telling people, showing people, oh, look at this current show that's on display. This is the photo collective. This is Dave. This is what he's doing. And he was just this really motivated individual, this stranger to me I'd never met before. And, uh, you know, to, and at the time, I was like, you know, who is this guy? He's just a stranger. I, I don't know. Um, but then I hadn't met him prior to opening, but through his enthusiasm and support, we eventually became friends. You know, and after getting to know him a little bit more, I came to find out that he was the head of the retail marketing for one of the most successful mutual fund companies in the United States. He has an MBA in, with an emphasis in marketing from UC Berkeley, which is one of the top business schools in the nation. You know, currently, he's the director of business operations for an online stock market education company who also runs the sales and marketing departments. No big deal, right? Those are kind of small credentials. Just this random stranger that likes photography as a hobby came in with these insane credentials of business marketing, degrees from Berkeley, and currently is one of the top leading marketing and sales associates for his company. And I would never take that information and kind of go after him and try to like, you know, kind of recruit him to come help with this small business started by one 26-year-old kid. That to me was like, wow, he's in a league of his own. But because he believed in what I was doing, he came to me. You know, he said, um, you know, I, I, I said, Greg, I, I casually mentioned that he had tons, or he, he casually mentioned that he had tons of incredible ideas to further market my business with an itch to dedicate some time and energy to a new project. So that's like, wow, a blessing in disguise. This UC Berkeley graduate comes in, hey, I've got a ton of ideas for the photo collective. And I, have you considered any formal marketing? Well, actually. I've considered it, but I haven't known the first step towards it. And he said, OK, well, let's talk. Let's go to lunch. So we met up, and we went to lunch, and we started talking. And now he's voluntarily, he is a full-time marketing director for the full Well, I don't want to say full-time, because he has a career of his own. But is, just because he's so passionate about photography and about what I'm trying to pursue, he has taken his time away from his own life to help me out. On, on a, you know, and, and, and everyone's going to ask, well, then why? Why would he do that? Why would he take the time to help some small, young, independently owned business? And I thought the same thing. So I asked him one day, recently, I asked him, I said, you know, Greg, how did I get so lucky to receive such much needed help in such an important time in the development of my business and inspiration from one of the most genuine, intelligent, educated guys that I'd never met before opening up the photo, the photo collective? And you notice how I set that question up? Like I just like flattered him to death, you know? Like there's no way that he can respond negatively to that. It's like, how did I meet someone that just as amazing as you and exact, at the exact right moment that I needed it? Pretty much just flattered him. But anyways, he, uh, you know, he, uh, I filled him with flattery and appreciation for what he does, and he responded with, "The answer is simple. I'm inspired by you and what you're aiming to accomplish. Your passion is contagious. I too wonder how I got so lucky, my friend." So you know. I think a lot of that goes back to your personality, your vision, your what you're wanting to accomplish. Is it a valuable opportunity? Is it a valuable business? Is it something that's going to benefit people? And if so, you might actually run into some people that are willing and able to help you that have uh, that have that same vision. So I, I don't I don't recurg you know I'm not regurgitating this conversation in attempts to impress any of you, saying that oh I'm so great that he wanted to help me. Um, it's simply to, a great example of how your own motivation and your actions can come back to benefit you on a level that perhaps you don't generally think of. Something that I didn't really realize was going to lead to having a, a marketing director that's going to help you know, fill the space. Um, it's kind of like, this is going to get like real, real, real deep. If any of you watch, like, I don't know, I just like to think kind of like a little bit deeper. It's almost like without even realizing, the universe kind of provided a road or an op a connection for me to be able to accomplish what I was already actively working hard towards. So it's like, because I put my passion out there and I put my, my dedication out there on the line, I kind of was able to make those, co those connections that I needed. Um, yeah, I mean, the universe can provide roads and ways and connections for you to be able to accomplish what you're actively already working hard towards. That sounds like a quote from ancient aliens. Like, ancient astronaut physicists believe that if you do this, you'll have success. Like, that's not what I'm meaning. Um, so recognize what your needs are. And if you simply cannot fulfill them on your own, what kind of person might be able to help? 
I have many examples of allowing people to help myself, or allowing people to help, but for example, Greg, who is the marketing director, had another example that I won't go as deep into, but uh, my friend Rick, who wanted to learn how to use studio lighting, and I brought him in, started teaching him some stuff, and then he said, hey, you know, I'm a web developer. I can up your website. I can revamp it. I can you know, add this to it. We can get this going. We can create an iPhone app. We can get everyone integrated on Twitter and, 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 and Facebook, and I can control your entire social networking feed with the blog and all this stuff. And I'm like, sure, let's do it. So you're probably wondering, well, why, why are these people actively helping? Because they believe in what we're doing. And are they receiving compensation? Yes, but is it by way of a salary? At this point, no. I wish that I had the money to be able to pay these people that are helping me, but at the time, they are actively willing to help for various reasons. They believe in what I'm doing. They, um, they have access to an amazing studio. I let them use the studio whenever they want, studio lighting equipment. There's great value in networking and, and, and meeting other people. Um, as a small, untraditional business without a physical product to sell, we're not we're not selling, you know, we, we don't have a product that we're selling. We don't have Kiss Sticks. We don't have uh, an iPhone app. We don't have a, a you know, a, a dinner menu. We don't have anything that we're physically selling. We have a space. Our, our business is a space. It's getting people in our space, using our space, renting the space, and, you know, furthering their own, their own, um, I guess their own photography. So it's hard, it's oftentimes difficult to underline the responsibilities of employees, interns, volunteers, etc. The most important thing to know is recognizing who is genuinely making your life easier and at what expense. Meaning, you know, are people that are seeking out to help, are they helping or are they creating more of a hassle and they're not really actually, you know, in it for the right reasons? Um, like I touched on before, we don't or currently don't have a budget to pay employees. We hope to, we can all kind of mutually build it up to the point where we can hire on a full time, a full time assistant or a full time intern or a full time employee at the photo collective that has specific jobs. Um, but if, and the time being, you need to mutually agree on either trade or benefits to being a part of the company. So again, I put this on into perspective on your own scale. What can you offer if you don't have budget to pay someone? How can they actually benefit from? helping you build up this community, this, 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 uh, this business. Um, another important thing to note when starting a business is everything needs to be clearly written down and explained. Contracts are key. Both parties need to feel and understand that the work is fair and comparable to the benefits. And I know that sounds like, oh, it's a no-brainer. You have to have contracts when you're in a, in a business situation. But you'd be surprised that even with your, your, your closest friends, people that you feel are in support that would never do you wrong, a lot of the times, there's, a, there's, you know, there's things that happen that you end up six months later saying, wow, I wish I would have had that in writing. I wish I would have formed a contract that he was going to do this, and I was going to do this, or she was going to do this, and in exchange for this. Because a lot of the times, even your closest, strongest connections in starting your business, if it's your best friend that wants to start a business, you think, it's my best friend. He'll never do me wrong. I think someone mentioned earlier before I started speaking with the example of Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg and the Facebook app. Do you think that you know, when, when they were kind of creating that, he probably never thought that you know, years later he was going to end up in a huge lawsuit with his best friend that helped him invent Facebook. So that's kind of what I, I, and I don't want to scare you. It's not like I've had any major, major things happen. Um, but you need to realize, what are these people offering that are helping you? How well do you really work together? Are they lifting responsibilities off your shoulders, or are they creating more problems in other areas? And I've learned that even some of the most reliable friends and business partners in the beginning might not be the exact right people to continue to build up the company, despite how supportive or enthusiastic they were upon starting. Um, you know, once the photo collective was open, it was more than just a concept. It was more than a dream. The next step after getting past the hurdle of opening was the realization that we have to push it further and market our brand and services to the community. Having a business model that outlines various things is key. You know, how are people going to benefit from this business? How are people going to get involved? Um, what benefit does this, does this business offer the community? Is it something that d exists already? If it does, how is ours going to be different? If it's something that doesn't exist, why doesn't it exist? And maybe it doesn't exist for a good reason. Maybe it's not a good idea. But if it doesn't exist and there's a reason, there's a good reason, or there's not a good reason why it doesn't exist, that's your opportunity. Identify that opportunity and run with it. Um, 
You know, what sets it apart from other small businesses? Does it fill a void? If not, could it fill something that otherwise doesn't exist? Um, how much time do we have? Maybe four more minutes. Four more minutes. I've been I, I've been jumping all over the place, and I apologize if everyone is just like, "What is he talking about?" Um, I want to just briefly talk about um, you know current marketing efforts, explaining the idea and the concept of hosting workshops and classes. Like I said, we don't have a physical a physical product that we're selling. So for us, I, for me, I always wanted to give back to the community. I wanted to provide opportunities for people. I wanted to bring people together because I think that there's a lot people in the, we can do a lot more working together than seclusively, you know, on our own. So from a personal standpoint, why do I want to host classes and workshops? Well, it, it uplifts and unites the community and brings people together. That's my personal reason for hosting, a, for hosting workshops and classes. But on a business standpoint, it has to be more than that. From a business standpoint, hosting classes and workshops, bringing people into my space isn't going to pay the bills. It's, it's really not. So from a, burst, uh, from a business standpoint, why do we have these marketing efforts? Well. The workshops and classes bring people into the studio, at which point we continue to market other events and studio rental time, in which we continue to pay the bills and make it possible to grow the business. So I think the important thing is finding that balance between your personal goal, your personal dream of why you're starting this business, and how it can actually benefit the community. And I think it has to have a good balance of both. Because if you're not passionate about it, if you're not really invested in your product or in your brand, you're not going to be able to market it to those that you're needing to market to. If you don't believe in your product, if you don't believe in your brand, if you don't believe in your business, why should anyone else? Um, since we only have just a few minutes left and I've been jumping all over the place, I want to just put all notes aside. And I, if we have a few minutes, I would like any potential questions, anything that didn't make sense, or any individual questions as far as you know, struggles that I've had or things that I see in the future, anything at all. If there's any questions, feel free to raise your hand and we will kind of go off of those. Right here. So do you go into this alone or do you have a partnership or have some friends that want to do it with you? Or? That's a great question. The question was, did I go into this alone or did I have a partnership or a business partner? And the answer was, I did it alone. Um, I started alone, but then quickly realized I needed the help of many others. The idea was kind of something that I came up with on my own because of the need for a space. Um, I started looking for buildings. I started you know, kind of planning this business model. I did it all on my own out of the passion that I have for giving back to the photo community. But then, like I said, even before we opened, I needed help with you know, renovating the building that was in bad shape. I needed help with painting. And then once we opened, I needed help with uh, building a website. I needed help with marketing direction and stuff like that. So what started by myself, I ended up quickly realizing I needed to bring people together. So now I would consider the business is not owned or operated by me solely. I have a full-time intern, I have a marketing director, I have a web developer, I have, um, I have various networks and connections that are all kind of working together to build it up. Good question, though. Um, how long did it take you to find the place, and did you have to take a loan, and how big is it? That's a great question, financial question. Um, it took me looking for two and a half years looking at every single like abandoned listed building, whether it was abandoned or whether it was on the market, Two and a half years to find a building that was perfect for what I wanted. I knew that I wanted something big enough. I needed, I needed to have a good location in the heart of downtown. We're currently located at 200 South 561 West, which is uh, half a block west of the Gateway, right there by Club Sound and in the venue. You know, a little bit more of an industrial part of town, but still mainstream. Took me two and a half years of looking on Craigslist, KSL, touring buildings, meeting different realtors, um, till I found the exact right spot. And it's a long story how I, how I found the spot and how it came to be. But as far as taking out a loan or not, fortunately, while I was looking for buildings, I had been saving a lot of money for my own client base, uh, my own client uh, commercial projects. And I had a specific commercial client at the time that ha recently I did a, a large uh, TV commercial for that paid a substantial amount. So I took that commercial, uh, that commercial uh, TV spot money and I put it into a savings account and I said okay this this amount is going to go towards opening up the photo collective I didn't touch it so I had a de decent little nest egg to start so I got into the building I paid the first month's rent the security deposit started building the space and my savings went <laughs> I was down to like a few hundred dollars and I was supposed to be opening up in a few months and I was like wow what have I gotten myself into I had a ton of money saved up 
by the time you write, you know, a 3,500 square foot space in the heart of downtown, you can imagine it's not very cheap to rent. But I'm on a lease situation. I didn't have a loan. I'm not in any debt. And within six months, I've built that money back up from different workshops and classes, different people renting the studio. So we're at a, we're at a good spot. Awesome. Another question? Do we have any time? I think we're out of time. Okay.